Hey, welcome to Alum House Sound. My name is Dave, and today we're gonna to talk about remote mixing. Now, in today's day and age, many of us have digital consoles. These, obviously, the Behringer X32, the Midas M32, incredibly popular. The Behringer Wing also got its newest release uh, in the past couple weeks, but that is just scratching the surface. So many different manufacturers from Allen & Heath to Digico uh, to, uh, to all, all the other platforms that you can have, the digital console now opens up this opportunity to remote mix. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, that's a great question. And actually, I was invited by a gentleman named Eric who runs a website called Remote Mixing. And uh, it's initially more of a blog post, so he's going to do a bunch of written articles there, but he's also taking and linking to any materials he can find about remote mixing. Let's think about this as a concept here. I'm on the East Coast. I go to my church. On a Sunday morning, I end up running sound uh, or playing drums like I did yesterday. And then I come uh, back home. And in the afternoon, what if I had somebody in a different state that needed help? Maybe they're West Coast. And a couple hours later, I could log in to something somehow in the webosphere, and I could remotely mix for them. That's an awesome concept. We're gonna dive into this interview, this discussion, not an interview really, but more of a discussion. Let's dive into this discussion and talk with Eric and see his thoughts and what he's trying to do to compile information about remote mixing. So let's run the intro clip and then we'll get into that discussion. Great. I'm glad you're here. Um, David, I'm glad that you came on today uh, for us to be able to chat. My name is Eric, um, introducing Dave in a few moments here. Um, but we're glad for the audience, you guys all to be listening in on us uh, as we just talk a little bit about remote mixing um, and the idea behind it. I'm excited that Dave's on. So um, Dave, why don't you give us a short intro about yourself? Um, you know, I found you through YouTube. So tell me a little bit more just about yourself, about your, your YouTube content, like what, what you're about um, in that space. Yeah, sure. Eric, I'm, I'm excited to be here today. And whether it's your viewers, my viewers, anybody on the, the webosphere as it lives right now, uh, to have this conversation because it's one that is coming quick. But uh, before we dive into that, a little bit about myself. I'm Dave Allen. I'm located in Richmond and I'm a sound engineer, professional musician, and uh, been a multi-instrumentalist most of my life. But I found a big need many years ago to help kind of upskill and grow the, the church. I'm a, a huge faith-based believer and have grown up in the church, uh, playing music in the church, and then found that most musicians and most churches nowadays have a soundboard. And if you go to any venue, they've got a soundboard. But predominantly at churches, most sound technicians don't really know what to do with all the knobs, all the buttons all the things that are blinking at them as, as service is going on, and trying to take an opportunity to use this digital platform of YouTube to just spread education. Um, you know, it does give me an opportunity to work with churches one-on-one -on -one quite frequently, but in general, man, if you come in and you, you just get this new board and you wanna search for something, uh, I'm hoping that some of my content is gonna be valuable and, and can help get you up and running and at least talk about, you know, kind of at the broad levels, how to do specific things on uh, on the soundboards. Yeah, fantastic. I love that. And like I said, that's, I mean, David, that's how I found you. I was on YouTube. Um, I, you know, I'm running remote mixing and trying to find um, just folks who are teaching others about the basics of audio. You know, um, some of it's for myself. Like, I, I don't consider myself an expert in it, but I want to learn more. So, um, if for me, it was great to just watch some of your videos to get a flavor of like who you are, but also like what you teach and how you teach that. Um, so it's fun to hear like that. That's sort of been like your, you know, the passion around and the, the impetus around doing YouTube. Um, I just want to say one thing before we even jump into remote mixing. Like I partly am a part of like I, I, I wanted to invest time in the remote mixing dot com um, website. And because I wanted to invest in this conversation about the capability of trying to do remote mixing for churches. My background, I, I came from a really small church. Um, my parents started going when I was younger and um, and we just didn't have resources, you know, people, volunteers to do a lot of things. And so to me, it really felt like, hey, if I could use some of the skill sets I have to grow a conversation, to start a conversation in the community, 
around this kind of remote capability so that it could extend and enhance, you know, online church services, any live streaming audio kind of experiences, it would be fun to try right, and try to do that. Um, so really like the hope and, and the dream behind sort of the website and even the blogging and this content here is really just open doors to create, um, you know, a greater pool of volunteers who can be able to help at churches, uh, run services, um, even volunteers who might be at home, right? And if, if they could even remote in and mix for an online service of some sort, like those are the kinds of, that's the kind of space I'm hoping to provide um, uh, energy to and conversation for. So so glad glad you're here to join me in that. Um, maybe to start, David, like, could you, you know, I, I just sort of um, asked you to come on, but like, could you tell me a little bit more from your own point of view and your experiences? Like, what are trend, like, what are current needs and trends in churches that you see who are both trying to do in-person services and online streaming service, especially as it comes to, you know, audio, you can touch on video too, because it's so integrated, but, um, but yeah, tell me more uh, what you're thinking in that space or what you're seeing in that space. Yeah, it's a, it's a good place to start because I think that even the church that I was at this past weekend, again, in a different state, and I had to sit down uh, with some of the leadership to start out with and just say, you've kind of got with the topic we were talking about, two different paths. And as an organization, you need to determine, do you want to go with option A or option B? And then that's going to drive some of the decisions that you make, whether it's personnel on a Sunday morning, you know, how many volunteers does it take to make that vision happen? Uh, equipment needs and all those different aspects. And I think that right now in the church, we see a huge, uh, a huge boost in technology, obviously, most people are trying to live stream. It's funny now, side note, to watch a lot of conversations with uh, MXU and some other folks to, as they talk about now, do we need to live stream everything? You know, COVID came, 2020 happened. Let's just call it out. It happened. But 2020 happened and everybody said, man, we've got to, we've got to go online so that our, our, you know, our church community can still participate. And with that, we saw the boom of everybody grabbing cameras, you know, digital boards, trying to get some sort of uh, audio and video combination out onto the internet. Now with that comes this follow-up conversations. We're four years past that time now, right? Uh, at the filming of this video, we are in almost into quarter four uh, of 2024. And so we're, we're starting to talk now about, man, what is the church itself, the, the individual church, the smaller organi organization, the local church, what does each one specifically need? What are they called to? And this is a conversation we're having even at my church um, right now. I'm, I'm the tech director. And the way I explain that is if it plugs in on Sunday morning, it's in my purview. Um, and we're a set up and tear down church. So we set up our cameras, our rig, our audio every week, and we tear it right back down every week. Um, there's a lot of wear and tear on cables, and but then you get into the volunteership. And let's say that you do want to have high standards. Everyone strives for excellence. Excellence honors God, and I fully believe that. And we want to have high standards. But the challenge that I see is oftentimes our leadership is looking at the what I would consider mega churches, the biggest churches, and they're watching their live stream. And they're evaluating that live stream and they're hoping to get there. However, then you talk about budget <laughs> and not just budget of money, but budget of volunteers. Right. Because when it comes to um, when it comes to putting on a huge broadcast, it doesn't just take gear. It takes people people resources to be able to run cameras, to be able to cut cameras, to be able to do the setup and all of the little things that have to happen. And if you're a team of four on a Sunday morning, maybe you need to scale back the expectations and take a different approach. And so I think as we talk about that piece of it, of what is the church actually called to, that then determines what, uh, what you know, technology needs we put in place. Uh, the other piece that I'll mention is there's been a bunch of automation. Uh, I'm sure most of the viewership here has been following Churchfront. They do uh, great bits and pieces and MXU as well. They talk a bunch about automation, how they can take, let's say, uh, ProPresenter or Ableton, and you can connect the two and you can take Ableton with your backing tracks and now trigger you know, uh, words on the screen through ProPresenter. So that automation piece is really huge. Um, 
but that then gets into troubleshooting. What do you do if something doesn't work? So I'll pause there because I'll keep going with my thoughts, but hopefully that kind of touches at least on what I'm seeing right now in the, the current sphere of, of conversation. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate you bringing up even the question. I mean, the foundational question about like, is it, do we need to live stream everything, you know, or what things are need to be live streamed or when should we live stream those things? Um, this actually touches, I mean, like I said earlier from the intro of sort of the reason why remote mixing is around is like, and even my own personal story, like part of it was having a lack of volunteers to do things, um, to do things at all, you know, and then let alone yeah. think about how do we make this a certain level of quality according to whatever benchmark we've seen, like out in the ether, right? Out in the worship world, yeah. or out in the church world, and things like that. So I'm curious to know, like, um, maybe like what you can tell, like, I think one thing, one stream of, or like one idea that comes to my mind is sort of like, how do we effectively um, help other, uh, like we're a church and we resourcing in terms of people to support um, doing um, any kind of mixing, let alone remote mixing. What does it look like to build a team like that? Like from your perspective, like what, how would it, what would it look like to train them, to teach them, to grow them and make them more effective? Um, you don't have to boil the whole ocean with the answer, but I'm just curious, like, where would you start, right? How do you grow that? Yeah, I've, it's kind of funny you mentioned that and and not pre-planned, but, but quick plug. I've actually got a playlist on my channel. It's about training yeah. sound technicians. And the reason being, I did a, I did a poll on the channel. So the channel was probably at the time, 12,000 subscribers at that point. And I did a poll and just said, how do you practice as a sound technician? Do you practice at midweek, you know, midweek practice? Like when uh, when the band is practicing too, are you like actually taking an opportunity to test and play around with different settings? Do you just show up on Sunday, turn it on, and that's what you do? Do you do any additional practice midweek? And the shocking reality was that very minimal responses of people actually taking the initiative to practice. So Again, I mentioned early on, I'm a professional musician. I, I've been playing trumpet since I was in third grade and went all through college as a musician. And my wife is also a musician. And when we look at it, we approach most things as a musician, meaning we're going to start something. We're probably going to fail pretty quickly. But if you take a calculated approach at consistently taking small steps, you're going to be able to grow and foster something that can really be uh, us usable. If you, if you think about it that way. So for me, the way I cut my teeth in, in practicing, we live in a day and age where we have multi-track opportunity with most people, I should say, if you're on a digital console, you've got the ability to plug in a laptop with a very minimal cost uh, digital audio workstation. We refer to those as a DAW, a D-A-W. And you can plug in a DAW through a USB cable and you can hit record. You could do it midweek practice, you could do a service, you know, Sunday morning practice, whatever the case is, you can record those tracks and then you can go home and literally plug in some cheap earbuds in a relatively free app. And you can start to play with EQ and compression. You can start to mess with the faders and you can practice at home just like the vocalist is going to practice. The guitar player is going to practice midweek ahead of that service. Now mm. you're not practicing to refine perfection on that specific week's mix you're taking a previous week's mix and you're refining the skills of what do I hear? How do I train my ear? And what do these tools do? The faders, the volume, the gain, the EQ compression, maybe you get into effects and add some reverb and delay. And how do you kind of pepper those in to your mix? Then when you get into a, a midweek practice or a Sunday morning service, you know what tools you're looking for. So practicing is a huge thing. Uh, anytime I get an opportunity to be in front of people and teaching them live, I'm always telling them up front, just spoiler alert, my whole plan is to find one person at this organization that wants to learn how to practice and take the steps to do it. Yeah, I absolutely love how you almost like, I mean, you break it down to like, I mean, just using your analogy about being a musician and learning how to practice, but then taking and bringing it into this space with today's technology. Hey, we can take a DAW, we can record multiple tracks. And then you can play with EQ compression against each of those tracks and understand what do the things happen. I know 
for myself when I first came and sat in front of a soundboard. It's just overwhelming. You know, like, what are all these knobs? Like, what do they do, et cetera? Mm-hmm. Um, but the ability to actually just learn what does what, I mean, that just builds, for, you know, I'm just thinking about the, sm- the mid-sized church that has one volunteer who does it week on week. Like, if there's one other person in this church community who doesn't need to know how to do it right away, but is willing to go home and just practice, like play around for 15 minutes on a digital console and, or do, you know, a DAW to like, see what those knobs do. Like that would be a win. Right. And that ought to be probably the win to think about as a church, right. It's to just get, get people yeah. interested in actually um, seeing how the technology, you know, how, how mixing and how the technology can um, kind of have an impact um, on the experience. And so great. Cool. Um, I'm curious, like, let's, let's pivot this back to like the remote mixing concept and idea. So one thing I wanted to ask you was just from your perspective and how you've seen the technology evolve over time, like what stands out to you in today's like landscape when it comes to remote mixing itself, right? Um, you know, in, in particular, like, for example, like what are capabilities that um, you see that are really exciting? What are ones that you actually wish were getting developed in the near future? Um, but yeah. Things like that. Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting topic. So when I think about what I've seen come up, I, I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s watching TV shows. So before we get to remote mixing, think about what we do on a weekly basis now. If you are live streaming any content, you're doing far and above what your favorite sitcom does. What do I mean by that? Your favorite sitcom crafts 17 minutes of content with 10 to 12 minutes of commercial breaks, but 17 minutes of content and they film for, let's just say a week, it's probably more, but if they film for a week with cuts and takes and this and that, and they've got, you know, your audience and, and, you know, piping in different sounds here and there, all that so that you can watch your favorite sitcom, you know, and a half hour show Nowadays, we get to watch sporting events. Those sporting events are relatively live, you know, happening. Obviously, there's some delay that we know about, but the same vein, we're coming into our own churches and we're turning on cameras and we're connecting to the internet and we're hitting the go button and we're creating content live, you know, 45, 60, 75 minutes, two hours worth of content. And it's live. It's happening right now or 20 seconds ago, you know, um, and it's, it's just amazing to me that we're doing, we're living in this space where we can do that. I, I have some, uh, our, our church supports a group that is out in the, uh, the Middle East, or I guess it's Central Eurasia officially, um, not to call out specifically where they are, but they're over there on mission, their whole family, and they watch our content that we stream live at 10 a.m. Now it's six hours later for them, so they're watching it in the late afternoon, but they're watching our service from Richmond, Virginia, while they're across the world in Central Eurasia, live, when it's happening. It's just fascinating to me. Now, when we think about remote mixing, this is where it gets kind of funny. That guy, the the father of that family, was one of my sound techs when he was here in Richmond. Mm -hmm. And, And I think about the fact of what are the capabilities as technology continues to grow, uh, as and and evolve, things get faster. Internet connections are faster. What would it look like, to your point, if somebody that's in Eurasia could actually be connected through IP, through you know internet protocol, and actually be controlling a mix that's in my room in Richmond, Virginia? You know, what does that look like? Mm-hmm. And while we have that technology right now on some small scale, I mean. Plenty of my consultations that I do are across the world, and I'm using, say, Zoom as a platform because I can do a remote screen share. And most of my most of my people have the the Behringer X32 or the Midas M32 console, and so they can load an application onto their computer. Um, then I can control their computer and therefore control their console. So we always already see that happening, kind of in live. The, the challenge now is that that audio over IP. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of churches try to listen to their live stream and then make changes. And while that is okay, if you're listening to the actual live stream, 
there is somewhere of a 20 to 30 second delay typically. And so the change that you wanted to make should have happened 20 or 30 seconds ago, you know, not, um, not right when you make that change. But I think from a mixing, from a, a technology, it, it can open up great possibilities. I mean, you know, I serve at my church on Sunday mornings and I can mix there. And if I got a call from somebody, hey, we've got a Sunday evening service or we're on the West Coast and our Sunday morning service. Hey, I'm back home right now. Instead of maybe turning on the TV with the kids, uh, maybe I can just dial in and I can slap on some studio headphones and I can mix their Sunday morning service on the on the West Coast. Something like that. I mean, it's a it does open up uh, a, a broader perspective for people to volunteer and be involved and share their gifts with different organizations. So I think it's really cool. Uh, the last thing I'll say is this. The only platform that I know of that is actively promoting it is Personas at this point. Mm. Uh, I'm sure you've you've come across that. Um, I forget the name of it at this point, but that's the, the main one that Personas has. Um, they've got a cool little bus, I think, attached to the, the icon. That's about the most that I remember about it at this point. Yeah. But that's that's kind of where I think it can start to expand and, and, and really take the, those that are gifted and talented and, and be able to spread that, that opportunity to share. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things I hear is like, takeaway is like, Hey, if we were trying to remote mix, like the live worship, like the actual experience people hear, one concern is just latency, right? Delays, yeah. speed, um, consistency of even the signal itself, right? Of the internet signal itself. Um, and then I think the other thing too, is like, if, if churches have significant online communities um, and they have, so like, let's say they do have someone in the house, so to speak, like in the actual service mixing there for the front of the house um, experience, what did, you know, are, are there opportunities to try to remote mix, like mix remotely also for the online community? Um, I think about that. The persona solution is interesting. I actually have a guide on on the website, just loosely how to get that set up for anybody who's interested. Um, but really, I just cobbled together stuff you can find. I just made it all in one place, make it a checklist. You know, download this manual, follow these steps. Um, buy, you know, here are the mixers you should buy to to do those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, clearly, I think like one of the things that seems exciting to me that I think the church does have to decide every church, you know, despite size, particularly ones that aren't large, need to think about is, do we have one, do we have the technical capability gear, um, you know, bandwidth um, to, you know, to, to manage the cost and manage the support of the gear side. And then do we have the capabilities on the human resource side, right? The staffing side volunteers who can, where we can actually manage something that's online. I think once one of those things, those things are solved, then it's like, oh, how do we cobble together these systems? May it be a, clo I, I would call it personas, like the closed like ecosystem. It's all in one um, versus like some other ones. That, like one, the other side I've seen, you know, you've talked about is like people who zoom in and use a remote screen share um, kind of um, technology to kind of manage that. So, so yeah. Um, so David, this is great. I mean, I, I this is um, basically the essence of, the conversation that I just wanted to start. So I, I want to thank you for coming on and, and doing this with me. I think just as a high level takeaway for the audience to hear, like one thing that I appreciated David bringing up is like churches need to think is live streaming the right thing for us to do. Is this something we want to do, try to do, try to support. Um, as David mentioned, and we didn't really talk much about it, it's like, Hey, once we decide to do it, then there's a whole troubleshooting thing that comes into play. How do we manage um, that on an ongoing basis. And when problems happen, who do we call and how do we fix? Uh, I think the other thing, other takeaway that um, I do appreciate you bringing up, Dave, is just this technique of practicing. Uh, and, and one thing that comes to my mind, one word that comes to mind is just decomposing the act of mixing into smaller chunks and saying and helping a body of church, a body of volunteers really think, like understand hey, we don't have to do everything all at once with perfection. Of course, we want to do it with as much greatness and skill as we can, but we all have to start somewhere, right? We learn how to ride a bike somewhere um, with training wheels sometimes first or a balance bike first. We learn how to play an instrument by learning the scales or just learning how the notes play, right? And how dynamics work and such. Um, so practicing on the mixer, particularly using technology like a, a multi-track recorded session with a DAW, um, going home to do that. 
um, is one thing to consider. And I think the last thing um, for us to consider too is once a church says, hey, we want to do remote mixing, we want to enable this capability, I think it sounds like it comes down to testing the capability, testing, making mm -hmm. sure latency is there. Is it acceptable given our current setup? And understanding and learning from that test will inform if they need to make more investments and if they want to make more investments to go down that road. Um, so I think those are the three sort of takeaways there. Dave, is there anything, David, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I mean, I think you summed it up pretty well. I'd love to see, I'm hoping you know, you've got this, uh, again, the Personas one right now, the main one that is uh, is pushed right now in terms of being a remote mixing option. I, I love that they're kind of cutting the ground on that one, if you will, or breaking ground, whatever analogy you want to say. But they're, they're getting this out there. It's just an option. What we do know with most technology is there's going to be some open source. There's got to be some open source thing that comes up. Um, Mixing Station is a widely used uh, computer and tablet platform to mix with a number that that can interact with a number of different uh, mixing consoles. And so seeing something like Mixing Station potentially step in and, and offer a solution that could kind of bridge that gap, if you will, between the latency. But I, I, there's got to be a lot of resources like you talked about that are set up. Um, probably not just your standard plug-in router connection. You know, you got to have something more substantial to do it well and do it properly. And I do think, though, it comes down to what is the church or the organization looking to provide as a final output product? Yeah. And what is their budget, both people yeah. and monetary, to be able to facilitate that? And those aren't brand new questions, right? That comes up with any discussion, any, you know, we want to build a building. Okay, what do we want this building to look like? And how much money do we have to spend? You know, we want to put speakers in it. What do we want to do? And how much money do you? And all of those topics and are, are part of the discussion. We're just now at a technology space where it is very intricate. And most people are not going to see the things that go into it. They're not going to see some big box or some big thing that they can touch and go, hey, we paid for that. It's more about the service that we're offering and, and what is the quality of the service being provided, you know, again, with remote mixing. So I think it, I think you summed it up uh, very well. And it's just a matter of what do the organizations decide to do and how do we move forward from there? Great. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Um, and lastly, for the viewers, like I do want to, like, I want to close by thanking David for coming. I want you all to go check Dave, um, David out. Um, I'll put his YouTube channel um, the URL down here on the bottom of the screen, but it's one place to go and find him. Um, he even mentioned, you know, earlier, David, you mentioned there's there's a playlist or a set of videos or maybe a video that you have out there. Um, but also, here's also a URL to his, um, also his website as well. Maybe, mm -hmm. can you say a little bit more about this one? I actually, I didn't catch if you said, or I forgot if you told me. Yeah, no, the website was just a kind of a landing place, again, as a professional musician uh, and one that does, can consulting of different types. It's a way that people can contact me outside of YouTube. And so most people find me through YouTube or, you know, Google search or whatever. They'll find the YouTube channel and then they come in, they'll ask a question in the comments section. And I always answer questions in the comments. It's just something I feel is a kind of a value add to the people that are, if you're asking a question, let me see if I can answer it. But when people get more involved with questions or it's going to extend past that, then they can go to the website there, sound.alumhouse.com. They can track me down. There's some bits and pieces of, of past works that I've done there uh, as a musician, and then also a contact card where they can reach out just to start a conversation outside of YouTube. Great. Fantastic. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much, David, again. Thank you for coming on and um, starting this chat with me and just contributing to the conversation. Appreciate that sounds it. great, Eric. Thanks for having me. All right. Yep. See ya. All right, so that's an interesting topic. I'm looking forward to furthering this discussion with Eric and seeing what other folks he gets uh, to have input from his uh, from his website and maybe anything that we can see come out uh, from Eric in the future for remote mixing. It's going to be an interesting topic to see it develop. I'm curious to see how the technology that we live in this day and age of super fast internet, how can we start to capitalize 
on that technology to really be able to, to further our experiences and our opportunities for how we serve the church or other venues that you might want to mix for. You've got a certain amount of talent, and that talent can be used maybe not just in your local region, but also the world as a greater whole. So with that in mind, I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments section below. Let me know if you're experienced. Have you started looking into remote mixing? Have you tried to do any remote mixing? How do you get past that lag time of audio? We know that we can have instant reaction with our control from, uh, you know, from the, con the console itself digitally, but how do we get that audio to come through immediately? But I'd love to know your thoughts and your ideas and your concepts down in the comment section below. Let's further this discussion. Uh, Eric may end up picking up some of the information that's in the comment section below and using that in further blogs that he might write and just furthering the idea and the conversation as a whole as audio engineers. So thanks for checking out this video. If you've got questions, uh, leave those in the comment section. If you want to start a conversation outside of YouTube, if you need some specific one-on-one -on -one help, you can go to my website. That's in the description below. You can find the contact card and reach out to me directly that way. That's a great way to reach me and we can further this conversation outside of YouTube. But that's it for this video. Thanks for watching it. We'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace. <music>